All right. Hi, everybody. Good to be with you this morning. Thanks for being here, all of you online. Thanks for joining us as well. Uh, let me tell you a story. Back in 1954, some researchers uh, decided to try an experiment on these 11- and 12-year-old boys, all right? So they took this group of about two dozen boys, 11 and 12 years old, up to Oklahoma, which is a good place to do experiments. Anyway... There's this place called Robbers Cave State Park, and they took him to this park. And, and these, these 24 boys didn't know each other, all right? They're all strangers. So they take him up to this park, and, and they get there, and they tell the boys, hey, listen, boys, we're going to divide you into two groups, all right? And you get to come up with your own team name. And so one group decided to call themselves the Eagles, and the other group decided to call themselves the Rattlers, or as we say in Texas, the Rattlers, all right? So you got the Rattlers and, and the Eagles. And then they tell the boys, now, okay, now that you're into teams, we're going to have these uh, competitions between the two of you. And, and whoever wins gets prizes and trophies and stuff. And so they start having these competitions between the two groups. And, and you know what, beloved? It didn't take long for there to be some, well, whatever the 1950s version of trash talking was, all right, <laughs> between the two groups. And, and they were combative with one another. Uh, name calling with one another. There was vandalism in each other's camps, and there was even a fist fight. And remember, these boys didn't know each other the week before. But now that they're on these two teams or in these two groups, now they're at one another. And so the conclusion from the experiment was this the group with which we choose to identify with impacts how we see one another and treat one another. And also, I would add as a corollary, uh, we can be influenced in how we see others and treat others by the group with which we identify. And that is at the core of what's going on in our country right now, specifically with respect to critical race theory. We're in this hot topic series where we're addressing some of the current hot topics in our culture and then seeing what God's word may have to say about them. And today we're discussing critical race theory. You, how many of you have heard critical race theory? Okay, you would be hard pressed not to have heard about it. You must not watch the news at all if you haven't heard about critical race theory. And so in preparation for uh, our time today, you just need to know a couple things. One is I have read literally dozens of articles in preparation for this. And I've read them from every perspective. I've read articles on CNN and I've read articles on Fox News, all right, and everything in between. I've read articles from Christians. I've read articles from atheists. Uh, I've, I've read books. I've listened to sermons. I've done a lot of prep and time for this. And what I've, what I've found is our political bias comes out when we talk about this. I've really yet to find one, what I'll call fair and balanced, article on it. And so if, if, if I just may ask for our time and for our discussion today, if we could, could we just lay politics down? This is church. If you know me, I don't preach a political platform here. I preach this, right? That's why you like me, right? All right. Right? Thank you. I love you too, sweet pea. <laughs> So if, for, for our discussion, if we just could lay that down and just be speakers of the truth and love and maybe see what God's word has to say. But we're going to be honest about our country, about our past, about our present, and then about maybe an alternative solution. Okay, so kind of he here's how I see it, beloved. We brought over slaves from Africa to this country in 1619. And there were laws of injustice in our country from that time all the way up until the mid-1960s. When we had the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the Voters right, uh, Voter Rights Act in 1965, that pretty much ended, at least officially on paper, in the books, that officially ended racism in our country on the books. But the reality is you have almost... 350 years of injustice as this big boulder in our land. And you can remove it by removing the laws in the mid-60s, which we did, thankfully. But here's the reality. It left a hole in the ground. Now, what do we do with that hole in the ground? 
That's what this is all about. I think we all agree that they're officially racism's off the books. Injustice is off the books. But what do we do with the rippling effects of those injustices? That's what this is all about. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I didn't know that there were any rippling effects. I didn't either until I started talking to some of my black friends. And I asked them, and I did a little research. And so let me explain a little bit of the rippling effects of 350 years of injustice in our country. First of all, there are socioeconomic disparities between white families and black families in this country. These are just facts. The little research. The Federal Reserve did a study in 2019, so just two years ago, that showed this, that the typical white family in America has an average median wealth of $188,200, whereas the typical black family in America has a median wealth of only $24,100. We have eight times as much in the white community. And according to an article in the American Journal of Economics and Sociology, they found that the inheritance, this is among college-educated white families and black families, among college-educated white families, we, on average, pass down to the next generation more than $150,000. But children, get a job. I don't care. Don't wait for that. Go get a job. All right. Um, on the other hand, black families, college-educated black families, on average, only pass down $40,000 to the next generation. So there are generational wealth disparities, lingering effects to that big boulder, that's the hole. But then there are also, just to be honest, if you just lean in and listen with some of your real black friends, they may tell you very much that there are mental health issues. So I, I called some of my black friends and I asked them, you have any personal lingering effects from the racism that you've experienced? And they were honest, they said yes. I'll give you one example. Jeff Brazell, he's a friend in the community here. He's, he grew up in Alito, now lives in Weatherford. And he and I have been friends for a while. And uh, I asked him, I said, do you have any lingering effects? He said, well, let me tell you a story. Here in Alito in the 60s, I'd go out of my house and I'd go stand on the street corner and wait for the bus. And the white bus would come by and all my friends from school, I'd wave to them in the white bus, but the white bus would pass me by. I couldn't get on the white bus. I had to wait for the black bus. That happened right here. And that's the society he grew up in. And I said, well, bro, what are the lingering effects on you? And he said, well, I dealt with stress, anxiety, and depression. And I had doctor prescribed medicine for that. That's what Eric talked about last week with mental health issues. He said, but I'm a man of faith, and eventually I just decided to quit cold turkey and trust God to deliver me from that, and he did. But you can see that there's still this hole in the ground. You can't just remove 350 years of injustice and expect everything to be fine. So what do we do about this hole in the ground? Well, in, into this hole in the ground, if you will, comes critical race theory. And they're trying to address... This is what we do about the hole in the ground. That's what critical race theory is all about. So let's talk about what's critical race theory. Okay, in order to understand critical race theory, you need to understand critical theory. Because critical race theory is an offshoot from critical theory. Well, what's critical theory? For that, you got to go back to Karl Marx and Marxism. And the, and the basic philosophy of Marxism is this. He divides the pot, and again, we don't have time to go deep. We're at 30,000 feet here. But the basic premise of, of Marxism is he divides the populace into two categories, the oppressors and the oppressed, the haves and the have-nots. And this is why it worked so well in communist countries, because that was a fact. Socioeconomically, there were the haves and the have-nots, the oppressors and the oppressed. Then you take that philosophy. That, by the way, that didn't work here because we had a strong middle class, and there's still, because of the freedom and, and economy we have, there's still upward mobility in this country. So critical theory didn't work here. But what these people, these researchers, these uh, professors, mostly from Harvard University in the late 80s, decided to do was to take critical theory and apply it not to our socioeconomic differences, but to our racial differences. 
That's how we got critical race theory. And so they, instead of dividing us uh, as the oppressors and oppressed socioeconomically, they divide us into oppressors and oppressed racially. And just to be bluntly honest, the oppressors, that's us, white people, and the oppressed are black people in this country. But instead of me telling you um, what critical race theory is, I'm going to let them tell you. So here's a definition that's, uh, there's really not one definition out there that everybody agrees upon, but here's one that I've seen several times that I think is, is fair and just. So CRT, critical race theory, recognizes that racism is ingrained in the fabric and system of the American society, and the individual racist need not exist to note that institutional racism is pervasive in the dominant culture. This is the analytical lens that CRT uses in examining existing power structures. So, okay, I've always kind of believed that as long as there are racists, there will be racism in our country. But the way they see it is, you can see they divide individual racists with institutional racism. So even though that boulder is gone, there are still systems in place, institutions in place that promote racism. This is how they see the world. This is the analytical lens with which they see the world and with which they examine, notice, power structures. Just to be honest, what's the end game for these people? Power. They want power to change, to make change. Just being honest, I think that's fair. Now, an offshoot of critical race theory that maybe you've heard of also is called intersectionality. This is sort of a, intersectionality is basically CRT on steroids, all right? So here's intersectionality, and I'm telling you, this is how people see the world. Several people in our country, this is how they see the world now. Here's a definition of intersectionality from the Encyclopedia of Diversity and Social Justice. Again, these are their words. Our experiences of the social world are shaped by our ethnicity, race, social class, gender identity, sexual orientation, and numerous other facets of social stratification. Okay, let me explain that as best I understand it. They see the world socially with, as a strata. That means layers, all right? And again, just being bluntly honest, at the top layer are heterosexual white men. Me, okay, for example. We're at the top because if you look back at the history of our country, guess who founded our country? Heterosexual white men. We were in power. That's just how they see history. That's how they see the world. And then underneath that, they see this strata uh, of, of social relationships. Okay, so at the top, heterosexual white men. Underneath that, heterosexual white women. Underneath that, uh, a heterosexual black man, underneath that, a heterosexual black woman. Underneath that, a gay white man, underneath that, a gay white woman. Underneath that, a gay black man, underneath that, a gay black woman. So you can see in our country, if you buy into this uh, intersectionality philosophy and you're a gay black woman, you're looking up, you're like seven layers deep. This is why you think, man, I am oppressed. I'm a victim. You can see, you can see why this breeds a victim mentality. It's, have you seen that in our culture? Okay, me too. Why? This is why. You just, this is how you see the world. I'm oppressed because this is how I am. And in order for me to be on the top, I got to climb seven layers to get there. This is how they see the world. Okay, that's what CRT is and intersectionality. Now, uh, what's good about this and what's maybe not so good about this? Okay, what's good about this? Well, I think God can redeem anything. And I think what's good about this is at least, you know what? At least we're talking about the hole in the ground now. I've reached out to several of my black friends and asked them, and I think this has been consistently true. If you, if you have a relationship, and I hope you do with a black friend, and you have the kind of relationship where you love and trust one another, and they can tell you the truth about how they're really feeling, they will most likely tell you, that there is still this undercurrent of frustration in the black community in America, even in the church, that the church, especially the church of Jesus Christ, has, has left that hole in the ground alone for too long. We have not spoken up enough about it. We have not dealt with it. We've left it there. We have not led out and change. And they're frustrated by that. And the reason why CRT is gaining such traction 
in our country today is because it, it's an attempt. It's something. It's something. But I think the good about it is that it's fostering conversations that we've needed to have for a long time. We've needed to confront the truth about our nation's history. I'll give you one example. The Tulsa Race Massacre. It took place 100 years ago on May 31st and June 1st. Did you hear about it this year? How many of you heard about it this year? Okay, me too. How many of you, for you, that was the first time you'd ever heard about it? Same here. I guarantee you, I never heard about that in history class. Why not? Because we covered up some of the ugly parts of our history. And I think what they're looking for is for us just to be honest about our history, just to have a fair and honest rendering of our nation's history. Look, we live in a great country. I've been around the world many times. We live in a great country. We have a lot to be proud of. But we ain't perfect. Our, our past isn't perfect. We take comfort. Look, Israel, God's chosen people, great country, they are messed up. Have you read the Old Testament? I take comfort in that. So are we. Let's just be honest about it. That's all they're asking. So that I think God can redeem this in some good and healthy conversations and maybe a rewriting of history as necessary can come out of this. But what's potentially harmful about the adoption of this theory into our school systems and the fabric of our culture? Here are my thoughts. At the core of critical race theory is division, oppressors and oppressed. How can more division be the answer to division? That just doesn't make sense to me. I want peace. I want equal opportunity. It's not my responsibility to provide equity for everyone, but I feel a, a, a neighborly responsibility as a good citizen of this great country to provide equal opportunity for everyone. There's a difference. And if you look at the fruit of Marxist philosophy that is adopted by uh, nations and national leaders in history, the best indicator of future performance is past performance, right? The best indicator of what's going to happen in the future is by looking in the past. So let's be honest about the past. Let me ask you this. How in the world was Adolf Hitler able to convince his nation to exterminate six million people of a certain ethnicity? How was Chairman Mao of China in the 20th century able to exterminate tens of millions of people in his country? How was he able to justify that? This is how. The fruit of the adoption of this philosophy is death and division. Let's be honest. If you love this country, why would you want that? So, all right, Pastor Sherm, you got a better solution? Hey, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'm going to borrow it. This isn't original with me, but I'm going to borrow it from my favorite preacher. His name's Tony Evans. I got to meet him one time. I'm sure he remembers it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually one of the highlights of my life. Uh, I got to shake hands and meet my favorite preacher. Well, I listened to a sermon of his a couple of times, and instead of critical race theory, he introduced kingdom race theory. And here's how he defines it. Let's define it this way. He calls it the reconciled recognition, affirmation, and celebration of divinely created ethnic differences through which God displays his multifaceted glory as his people justly, righteously, and responsibly function personally and corporately in unity under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now that I can get behind. So, Dr. Evans, where'd you get that? Well, let's go back to page one of this book, all right? Here's what Genesis 1 says. Look with me. And God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So, beloved, you want to know what God's like? 
Look around. <laughs> this is what he's like. He exists in multifaceted glory. Let me break it down into the two genders. By the way, the Bible only knows two. I'll, Eric's talking about this next week. I'll go ahead and tee him up, all right? I'll illustrate it this way. I'm sitting with a couple in premarital counseling, and I'll ask the lady, hey, sweetie, what, tell me about him as a man that really attracts you to him as a man. And she'll say, well, he's strong. He's uh, a, my protector. I feel safe with him. He works hard to provide for me. I'm like, yes. Now, fella, what do you like about her? What has what attracted you to her as a lady, as a woman? Well, she's pretty, <laughs> right? Right? And, and what else? Well, she's, she's tender, she's compassionate, she's nurturing, she's caring, she does my laundry. Anyway, right? All these things. Well, guess what God's like? He's all that. He's your protector, provider. He's powerful. He's strong. He's also nurturing and caring and tender and compassionate. He's all that. Male and female who created them in his image. Why? As a display of his glory. He's done the same with ethnicity. You want to know what God's like? Take a look around the world. Red and yellow, black and white, multifaceted. Why? Because God's glory is on display. You can look at anyone in the world and say, you are a display of the glory of God. I don't care what your skin color is. That's part of the, the beauty of us. That's where he gets it. Now, that's just sentence one. Where did Dr. Evans get his second sentence? That we need to work as his people justly, righteously, and responsibly in unity under the lordship of Jesus Christ. I would submit to you maybe this passage in Ephesians 2. For he himself, that's Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups one. Now, in the Bible, we're talking about Jews and Gentiles. And has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Okay, let me just stop there. Quick explanation. So there was division between Jew and Gentile. Why? Because the Jews were part of the old covenant. The Jews had the law. They were God's chosen nation. And if you weren't part of the nation of Israel, you didn't get to participate in that covenant. But Jesus came to give us a new covenant. And so he didn't come to abolish the law, but he did come, he said, to fulfill it. And in his death, that law died. Did you notice? In his flesh, he destroyed the law, if you will that barrier between Jew and Gentile. Now, you can see the, his purpose. Notice, please, beloved, if you've been in church, you've heard all your life, Jesus died for our sins. Yes and amen. But please notice, he also died for more than that. Why did he die also? He also died, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. My friends and neighbors, red and yellow, black and white, the reason why Jesus died is not just so that you can have peace with God. Jesus also died so that you and I can have peace with one another. Do you see? Because in him, we are one. We are one new humanity. God's definition of race, the human race. We are one. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of God's household. That's who you are. Yesterday, I was at Promise Keepers with a bunch of men. That's why I wore the T-shirt, got our PK T-shirt, all right? We had a great time. It was a really inspiring time, and I was surprised that God used something that Michael Irvin, the wide receiver from the Dallas Cowboys, said to bless me. I was a little shocked by that. I'll be honest with you. Great wide receiver, the playmaker, but he actually preached a little bit yesterday in an interview. And this is something he said that I thought, man, that'll preach. He's talking, he's talking about telling his kids. He's like, man, don't let the world tell you your name. Go back to the owner's manual. <laughs> hey, children, may I speak to the young people here and online? All the young people, Pastor Em loves you. I want you to hear me. 
Do not let the world define who you are. You are not to be defined simply by the color of your skin. Go back to the owner's manual and let God tell you who you are, the one who made you. Let the one who made you tell you who you are. Well, who am I, Pastor Sherm? This is who you are. You are no longer foreigners. You're no longer strangers. This is who you are. You are a fellow citizen with God's people and members of God's household. That's who you are. You are in Christ, so you can go up to any person in Christ on any continent of either gender, of any skin color, and you go go up and say to them, hey, you're my brother. You're my sister. We family. That's who we are. And man, if we would just live that out, critical race theory would die tomorrow. There'd be no need for it. This is who we are. By the way, uh, are we good? Okay. I just, God woke me up really early this morning and I was having this dream of that Revelation passage where every tribe, tongue, and nation are gathered around his throne. And again, I don't know what it looks like. I'm just telling you God gave me this dream. But I've always viewed God's throne to be like a normal throne, you know, straight up and down. But his throne was actually (laughs) curved in the corners. And it's so that this whole circle could be around him. And it was people of every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping God. And here's the point, man. Don't wait for heaven to have that experience. Be intentional to reach out to someone of a different ethnicity than you for some fellowship, for some worship. Don't wait for glory to have that first time experience. Do it now. I'll give you another example. You've heard of Black Lives Matter. Well, I can 100% get behind that statement, but I cannot 100% get behind that organization. I've gone to their website. I've read what they're about. That's not what I'm about. So instead of getting behind that organization, you know what I did? I reached out to several of my black friends and I said this. I said, man, I hope, I hope you know this comes from my heart, but I just want you to know that you matter and that you matter to me. So I want to encourage all of my white friends listening. If you have a black friend, just from your heart, reach out to them and say, you know what, man? I just want you to know you matter. And you matter to me. Just reach out to them, man. Don't wait for heaven to have that fellowship. By the way, you know the rest of the story of those boys in Oklahoma? That group of 11 and 12-year-olds? After all the, the group conflict that they had created, they decided, okay, whoa, we need to dial this back. And so instead of having group competitions against one another, they decided to have those groups work together. And together they, they worked to fix the uh, sewer system there at the camp. Together they worked to, to pull this truck out of a ditch and did other activities where they worked side by side together. And pretty soon all the boys' hearts began to knit together. So much so that by the end of the camp, one of the groups decided to buy the other group some sodas just as a gesture of friendship. And one of the boys said before the ride home on the bus, hey, can we can we not take separate buses? Can we all intermingle and ride in different buses? I want to spend time with the other team. And my hope is that Trinity Bible Church, you and I, would live out Ephesians 2, working side by side, 
in the hope that, hey, man, maybe the same thing will happen with us. And together we can lead out, fill the hole, and change the world for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. So this is a good time for us to take communion. So if you would, get your cups out. You remember when we take the Lord's Supper, the Bible says we, we proclaim his death until he comes. All right? So this is all about the death of Jesus for you. And again, remember, Jesus died, not just so that your sins could be forgiven and so that you could have peace with God, but he also died so that you could have peace with one another. So before we take these elements, may I just say to you, let's just take a minute. If there's anything in your heart that is divisive, that is unjust, that is unforgiving. Like Jesus said, leave your gift there at the altar and go be reconciled and then come back and present your gift. If there's anything in your heart like that, would you just talk to the Lord about that now? Do just do some business with God now. Seek his forgiveness. Seek to forgive. And just usher in peace into your heart now. For he himself is our peace. Before Jesus died for us, he gathered his disciples together to celebrate the Passover meal, a celebration of life. He took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and said, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat of it. Scripture goes on to say it was in a likewise manner that Jesus also took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which I shed for you. Drink you all of this. Amen. And so, Father, we give you this sacrifice of praise. We invite you to do this work in our hearts, to be uh, portrayers and admirers of your multifaceted glory to be used by you as peacemakers in our land. God, grant us wisdom and a heart of love to love our neighbor as you would want us to do. In Jesus' name, our Savior, amen. <laughs>